right, welcome back. So, last week of CS125, one week from today, you guys will be done. 100% done. So that's, that's pretty fun. A little sad for me, I'm gonna miss you all, but today we have some fun stuff to talk about, so I'm gonna get right into it. Um, let's wrap up our discussion of generics from last time, that's where we're gonna start. So, we pointed out that what, we, what we'd like to be able to do is to get both the benefits of Java's compile time type checking. We wanna use the compiler to our advantage. We wanna use it to be able to help us catch problems. But we also wanna be able to design generic classes that can operate on any Java object or any Java object that has certain properties. So we saw some new syntax last time for doing this. I can declare when I define a class that it accepts a type parameter in the uh, angle brackets here, and then I can use that type parameter throughout my class. So I can define methods that return values of that type parameter, or methods that accept values of that type parameter, and then when this class is used, um, the compiler is able to check to make sure that, for example, set here is receiving an argument with the right type, with the type that the class was parameterized with when it was created. And the, the suggestion that I made for understanding how this works, although this is not how this is actually done, was to essentially imagine that when I instantiate an instance of this list class that's parameterized with the type parameter E, here I'm creating an instance of it um, parameterized with the type string. This is almost as if I had created a list class that where my get method returned a string rather than type E, and where my set method accepted a string as the second parameter. So this is almost the same thing. Again, this is not how this is done. Java doesn't actually create a different instance of the class for every type that's used throughout your program, for every type parameter that's passed. There's only one instance that's created, but this isn't a bad mental model for thinking about how it works. And so we got to the point, uh, this is actually code for our simple linked list class that we modify to use the type parameter. So now I can actually uh, check at compile time to make sure that I'm using this list correctly. So this works right now. Um, I've declared here on line 85 that my simple list reference is to a simple linked list instance that takes, oh, I have to add one thing here, sorry. I need my diamond operator over here on the right. So that says to the compiler, I'm creating a list that's gonna store integers so far in my code, everything I'm adding to this list is an integer, but down here, if I did something like simple list dot add, if I try to put a string into the list, you're gonna see that what's generated here is a compiler error. Again, this is good. This means that the compiler was able to tell me, hey, by the way, on line 93, you know, you told me that this simple list is, uh, is only gonna store integers, but on line 93, you added a string to it. All right, so this, this overall was quite good. Here's where it gets more fun. We're, we're not definitely not gonna talk all about Java generics because I could go on for days about them. It's, a, it's actually a pretty sophisticated system. But let's look at a different example. So imagine I have a class called Max. And what I wanna do is I want to allow this class to store, to be created with um, any Java object that I can find a maximum of. So my constructor takes, right now, this is an example that uses integer. My constructor takes an integer array and stores it, and then I created a instance method called max, which simply goes over the array and determines which element is the biggest in it. So this works fine right now, but let's try to parameterize this. So let's introduce the type parameter t to my class. I'm gonna replace um, integer throughout the class with t. And then obviously I have a problem here on line 12. With integers or numbers in Java, I can use the greater than or less than operators, but I don't have that anymore, I have an object. How do I compare two Java objects to each other? You guys have been using this feature recently, Jeremy? Compare to, right? So I have to replace this with something that looks like compare to current max, and then 
that's greater than zero. So what this says is it values i, oh, I need to be able to spell it right, is greater than the current maximum, then I replace the current maximum with the new value. Okay, so this looks great so far. It looks like I've, I've, you know, again, this is what's so fun about generics. I took this class that was only able to operate on integers, and now it should be able to operate on any Java object that implements comparable, except it doesn't yet. So what's the problem with this? Yeah. Yeah, so, so the problem here is that not, remember, not every Java object is comparable. Some of them are, some of them implement that, meaning that I can uh, compare two of them, I can put them in order, I can, I can use the compare to function, but not every Java object implements this interface. And so what the compiler is telling me is, hey, you've created this generic class, that's great, but there's no guarantee that the type T here actually implements compare to. But I can modify this to work. In order to do that, I need to do something, uh, another part of the generic system that's called a bounded type parameter. So here's the thing that's cool. The compiler knows all of the relationships between Java classes when it's compiling your code. So it knows whether or not the type parameter that was provided implements compare to. We can use this to help us design generic classes to make sure that the types that are provided when I instantiate an instance of my generic class meet certain requirements. So here's the syntax for doing this. We've seen this angle bracket syntax before, but now I introduce this new uh, piece of syntax to this. So T extends S. This is true if the type T that's a parameter to my class either extends S, or S is another type, so it's a descendant of S, or it implements the interface S. I know this is weird. You feel like it should be uh, T implements S if S is an interface, but it's not. Java uses extends here both to describe a relationship between the classes, S is a descendant of T, and also to describe a case where T implements the interface S. There's more syntax for this. I don't want to, I'm not going to get into it. We're not going to uh, use this in any of our examples. But I can tell the compiler a lot about what I want. I want certain features from this class. It has to be descendant of another class. It has to implement certain interfaces, whatever. So now I can go back here to my class where I was having this problem, which is that I'm not, there's no guarantee that the class implements, oops, see, I'm making my own mistake here. Yeah. So now when I parameterize the class, I'm telling the compiler T can be any type as long as it implements the comparable interface. And again, I use the extends keyword here. Once I've done that, I'm good to go. And now I can, so down here what I'm doing is I'm creating a instantiation of max that computes the max over integers. I can also create an instance of max that computes the maximum over strings. Let's try that. Strings are also comparable. Change these guys to strings. Same thing. Put something else in here. I don't know where test is going to sort out to. Okay, test is great, the greatest. These are in lexicographic order. Um, and I get all these other nice benefits that I had before. So for example, I've told Java that I'm going to use this to store strings, and so I can't pass an array of integers to the constructor, because the constructor requires an array of the type, oop, I am dropping things today, it's not the first time, um, an array of whatever type the class was created with. Okay. I can also have generic interfaces. You guys might have seen this already. When you've looked at, how many people have looked up the documentation for comparable before? Comparable is, a generic interface in Java. And so you might have seen this type parameter floating around, be like, what is going on here, right? Um, the syntax is exactly the same. So I can declare, for example, that this is an interface called simple list um, that any list can, that any class can implement, right? And it's parameterized by a type. So this establishes relationships between these functions. So for example, whatever type is returned by get has to be the same type that's returned by remove. 
which also has to be the same type that's the second argument to both set and at. There are a variety, there's lots of parts of the system that I'm not going to talk about. Um, you guys can check out the documentation if you want to know more. This is, you know, one of these sort of sophisticated, advanced part of Java that, that we're not, just don't have enough time to talk about. There's one thing I just want to point out because, um, you know, if you try to use this, you will probably run into this within five minutes, which is that I cannot create an array of a generic type. I can declare a reference to array of a generic type. We just did that in our max class. But I can't create it here. So the compiler will not allow you to use this bit of syntax. The details of why this is true are more complicated than I want to get into, but essentially, if I could do this, it would allow me to work around the generic system and actually load something into that array that wasn't of type T. This is because in Java, arrays are covariant, the generic classes are not. Um, the typical workaround, there's a couple of, of sort of gross workarounds for this um, that are used by some of Java's built-in classes. So for example, you might wonder, how does an array list work then? Array list is a generic class. It has to have an array somewhere that stores references to the, that type. That is actually the case. It has a nasty hack, and apparently there's a comment that says, don't do this. Uh, but, but, the, but that particular implementation does. The other approach is that you can create um, an instance of an array list or any other type from the Java Collections framework, right? So this works fine if I want to create an array list rather than an array of type T. I can do that. Okay, any questions about this before we switch gears entirely and talk about something fun? Not that generics aren't fun. So, yeah, sorry. Yeah, okay. Question about the, uh, oh, typical question about warnings. All right. So here's, here's the, the, yeah, that's a great question. So you guys have seen these warnings throughout uh, particularly when you've been working with what? What feature of Java seems to have triggered these? Anyone, anyone notice a pattern? Yeah. Comparable, yeah, compare to. Comparable in Java is a generic interface. So remember, if I do something like this, so now I have a generic class, if I create a new instance of max without providing the type parameter, this will work. But the compiler is going to complain. You will get an error message saying you are performing an unchecked or unsafe operation. Why? The reason is you're not allowing the compiler to help you. The goal of the generic system is to provide type information so the compiler can check at runtime, sorry, at compile time, that you are doing the right things with this maximum object. So if I did this, I could, um, or actually, hold on, better example. Let's go back, that's a great question. Uh, thank you for, for reminding me to talk about this. So here's my simple linked list class, right? So now I'm getting this compiler error because the compiler knows that I'm only supposed to put integers into this list because I told it on line 85. If I get rid of this type parameter and the diamond operator over here, this will work. It's the same class, but if you compile this now on modern versions of Java, you will get a warning. The warning is you are performing an unsafe operation and you can see why it's unsafe. If I intended this list to only store integers and I'm putting a string into it, it's possible that something is about to go wrong. Okay, so I have to, still haven't answered the question yet which has to do about why have you been seeing these warnings. The reason is because comparable is a generic interface. So whenever you implement comparable, you're supposed to tell Java what type you are being compared to. So let me just do a really quick example. If I have a public cl class, uh, foo implements comparable, And then I have this public, and it's int compare to object other. This is typically how you've been implementing comparable throughout this class. 
And the reason for that is that we didn't talk about generics until today. This is not the right way to implement comparable. Comparable is a generic interface. So whenever I, uh, extend it, I'm supposed to tell Java what I'm compare- what I'm going- allowed to be compared to. So the right way to do this is typically to do something like this. So now what you're telling the compiler is, I can be compared to any object of type foo. This is normally what you want to do. Normally you only want to be compared with objects of your own type. The other nice thing here is that now my compare to method takes the, uh, a class as, of that type as its first parameter. So remember when you guys were implementing compare to, you had to do this check to make sure it was the right type first. I don't have to do that anymore. The compiler will do it for me. So, last little bit of fun and goodness down here. So what I'm telling the compiler right now is that this class max requires a type T that extends comparable, that implements the comparable interface. But that's not quite what I want. Because it's possible, so, so here's an example. You can do this. Let me see if I can get the, here we go. And this is, I, I, I have no, there's no use case that I can come up with that would actually, where this would actually make sense. But you can do this. So here what I'm telling the compiler is, my class implements the comparable interface, but I can only be compared with objects of type bar. I can't be compared with myself. For my max to work, I not only need an object that implements comparable, but what else do I need it to be able to do? Okay. Well, we're close. So all of the values in the array are type T, and I'm comparing them all to each other. So what if I try to, um, add an array of objects that can be compared but not to themselves? Then this isn't gonna work, because I'm comparing pairs of the same type of object. So I not only need an object that ex that implements comparable, it has to be comparable to what? To itself. And so, the last bit of gnarly syntax you will see this semester, this is, in fact, the right way to do this. So I'm telling the compiler, my class max requires a type parameter t, that parameter has, that type has to implement comparable, and it has to be comparable with itself. If you use this on today's homework, that compiler error will be gone. And then you can live happily ever after, I guess. Thank you for asking that. All right. Other questions about generics? What's that? I still can't understand the question. Comparator? I, I don't know what that is. W what's the question? Ask on the forum. I'm, I'm not sure what the question is, but I'd be, I'd be happy to answer. All right. So let's spend the next hour, half an hour, uh, talking about something else. And, and this is, again, something, oh, sorry, balcony. can't, you cannot do that. Yeah, so the question is, what do I want to be compared with two different types? It's not possible, and, and the reason it's not possible is because of the type erasure that Java performs when the class is compiled. If, so, if you, the, the, the typical way to approach this problem is to say, let's say I wanted to be compared with both integers and doubles. Integers and doubles are both descendants of number, right? So I pick a superclass, right? And then I figure out what to do inside the compare to method. So the question was, can I do something like this? Can I implement both comparable foo and, um, comparable bar? No. Right? A and the reason is, when your code is actually, w when the class is actually generated, there's only one compare to method that, that you can support. Right? So there's no way to actually distinguish between them at, at, at compile time. It doesn't work. It's another, it's a good question. 
Other questions about generics? These are great questions. These are very sophisticated questions. All right. So let's, 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 uh, preview some material from, oh. Yeah. Okay. So the question is, what if I put object inside the angle brackets? I can do that. So this works fine. This essentially says I can be compared to any other Java object, right? What's that? No. Well, I mean, you have to, you have to implement it, right? So your class now has to implement compare to and accept any other Java object and figure out what to do, right? Um, usually this isn't the right thing to do. This is also equivalent to not providing a type parameter to the comparable input. But, but, yeah, if somehow your class can be compared with any other type of Java object, then you could add the object as a type parameter. And then you have to implement compare to down here and accept any other Java object and decide what to do about it, right? It's usually not the right thing to do. Good, good, another good question. All right, generics. Going once. Going twice. These have been great questions. All right, goodbye. Um, let's talk about parallelism. So, last semester I did a lecture where I took apart a computer in class. I decided not to do that again. Um, but what I want to introduce you to, and this is something else that it's, this is a seed I want to plant in your mind that's going to germinate in, in future courses when you see more about how to do this. Um, so back when I was a kid, uh, we had computers. It's hard to believe, I know. Um, those computers had a processor with a single processing core. This is an, uh, a diagram for an old Pentium 4. Has anyone even heard of a Pentium 4 anymore? Has anyone even heard of a Pentium? It's like an old architecture. Yeah, does anyone, uh, so actually the, the computer I took apart last year had a Pentium 4 in it. Um, this was the last generation of this particular type of chip um, that was produced by Intel. This is a diagram of, of the Pentium, and w the only thing I want you to take away from this is that Computer processors are actually really complex. If you've ever, has anyone ever seen one taken out of their machine? Like maybe, okay, do that sometime. Like find an old machine lying around. We have some actually in the department. Just take it apart, get to the point where you can actually get the processor out and, you know, turn it over in your hands and stuff like that. It's pretty cool, right? It's, it's an incredible feat of uh, engineering and something that, um, to be frank, you should be very, very, um, happy with your friends in ECE4, because they've built us these things, and they are, they are pretty amazing. Um, but there's all sorts of different complexity that goes on. This is probably about that big, maybe an inch on a side. But with, within that chip, there's all these different units that do these different things, right? Um, addition, subtraction, decoding instructions, whatever. But this was reality for a long time, is that your computer had a single processing core, which means at any given point in time, it was doing one thing. Those computers, and again, I, some of you may have never used one, were capable of running multiple applications at the same time, in the sense that I could both be browsing the web and checking my email and listening to, you know, MP, MP3 files on my Winamp, um, you know, music player. How did this work? There's only one processor, so there's only one thing that the computer is actually doing at any given point in time. So this works, so here's sort of the illusion, right? The illusion to you is that you're doing two things at one time. You're like, you're typing some code in your terminal, and you're also using Firefox. This is an old slide from a class I taught a long time ago, back when Firefox was cool. Um, but, but here's what's actually happening, right? So if I zoom in really closely, right? So it's the seconds on the, the y-axis. Eventually, if I zoom in enough, what I find out is that the computer processor is only doing one thing at a time. It's only ever running only Firefox, or only my terminal. The way that it fools me into thinking that there are multiple things happening at the same time is that it switches between those two things, or those three things, or 10 things, or 16 things, so fast and so intelligently that I never notice. To me, it blurs together. And this has to do with the fact that you are slow. Your human, you know, nervous system and your human sensory organs are incredibly well-developed and sophisticated, but they are not fast. 
It's one of the things that, you know, if self-driving cars may still have a hard time figuring out, for example, how to navigate a four-way stop, they're much, much better than you at just reaction time. They can tell, you know, when someone's brake lights go on, there's this long process, right? You remember reading about those dinosaurs whose, brain, whose brains, it was like if you kick them in the tail, it would take like several seconds for their brain to register that something had happened. That's sort of what you look like to a computer, right? But in the time that the computer is applying the brakes and figuring out how far it is from the car, you're still sitting there being like, you know, or you're on your phone, probably. Um, anyway, so, so here, are, here are these sort of rules of thumb that were established for the types of delays that humans will actually notice, okay? <laughs> so this was an old guideline for designing interactive systems, which said that if the system stalls for 15 milliseconds, a human will begin to notice and the computer will start to seem unresponsive. A one gigahertz processor can run 15 million instructions within that time period. Again, this is how slow you are. Human will take 50 milliseconds to notice that it's like, oh, Chrome seems frozen, right? In the meantime, Chrome has actually run 15 million instructions, right? The, the point at which video becomes smooth to you so if I, play, if I play you a series of moving pictures and I, and I play them slowly enough, they look like one image after another and I play them a little faster and at some point they start to blur together and what you see is an actual movie. The point at which that happens is around 25 frames per second. So that's 40 milliseconds between frames. Again, that's 40 million instructions. So when you have that YouTube video playing in your browser, What's happening is, you know, your computer does a little bit of work to draw the next frame of that video, and then it has like 39,900,000 clock cycles to do other stuff before it has to redraw the next frame to fool you into thinking that what you're seeing is actually a movie rather than a series of still images. For old tele, has anyone ever been on like a really laggy call? Maybe it's like overseas or something like that and there's a really large delay? Good, I'm glad that we've solved this problem. So on, on these old transatlantic phone lines, you, you could start to have these really long delays. And at some point, if you take two people who are trying to have a conversation and introduce more and more delay, you can't, you can't have a conversation. Because you say something and you're waiting for them to reply and they've started to reply but you think they're not gonna reply and so you start to talk again and, and now you're talking over them. So at some point, if you introduce more and more delay into uh, a back and forth phone call, these, um, these natural patterns of conversation will start to break down. The point at which that happens is about 100 milliseconds. Again, this is 100 million clock cycles on a one gigahertz processor. All to say that it's very possible for a computer to perform, to create this illusion for you, to essentially be running around between lots of different things, um, doing a little bit of work on that one browser tab, a little bit of work on IntelliJ, a little bit of work on you know, your music player, a little bit of work updating Facebook, um, and switching between those, those things so rapidly that to you, it seems like everything is happening all at once. Today, the reality in the world is different, which is that even your phone now has multiple cores on it. I don't know, I don't know what kind of processor I pulled for this image, but this is a, again, kind of a die layout uh, diagram of a, of a modern processor. And you'll see that there are four processing cores. Every one of those is roughly equivalent to that P4 that I showed you before. Not the same thing, um, but each one of those cores can be independently executing instructions. So in the past, whenever your computer seemed to be doing multiple things at the same time, it was actually an illusion caused by the fact that if the computer does a bunch of things and rotates between them fast enough to you, it all blurs together. Today, it's true. Your computer is actually doing multiple things at the same time, even your phone. Your laptop might have like 16 processing cores or eight. Uh, the server machines that we run some of our course infrastructure on have like 32 or 64 processing cores, right? Um, so this is now an actual true fact about the world. So today, parallelism, the idea that the computer is doing two things is both an illusion created by the operating system and real, right? 
So your phone is actually running multiple applications at the same time, but each one of those cores is still switching rapidly between all of the different things that the phone has to do to try to give you the illusion of more parallelism. So you might think that you're, you know, if you have like 70 browser tabs open, for example, right? You might think that all of those browser tabs are, are essentially running at once, but they're not. Only if your computer has eight cores, only eight of them can actually be running at a time. So the computer is still switching between all those tabs intelligently and rapidly to fool you into thinking that everything is happening all at the same time. So what does this have anything to do with Java or us or the code that we've, we've written? So, so far this semester, all the code that you've written is what we call single-threaded. We've only ever talked about your code doing one thing at a time. When we trace through what's happening in your program, we go line by line, instruction by instruction. One function calls another function, that function starts to run, we walk through what that function does, when it returns, we go back to the caller and then we continue going. So, again, this is known as single-threaded code. So here, so here's an example that we're gonna come back to a couple of times, um, with some timing built in. So, this is kind of a silly program, what does it do? So, there's a, I have a little, uh, process function here, and you can imagine this doing some actual useful work. Like, maybe it's doing some mathematical computation, uh, maybe it's computing digits of pi, I don't know. For the purpose of this example, it's not doing anything useful, but it does run a for loop for 20 million instructions or something like that. My code down here in my main method goes through a loop and it calls that function four times. The other two new things here are on line six and line 10, I'm using a built-in function of Java to compute how long it took. So when I start, I record the start time. This is a function called nano time that uh, gives me the time in nanoseconds. When I'm done, I compute the end time in nanoseconds, and then I subtract the two and divide by a million. So this is gonna give me milliseconds. So when I run this example, I'm seeing most of the time numbers, sometimes it's pretty slow, a lot of the time numbers in the 44, 43, 46 range. I never see anything lower than 40. And so I'm, I'm, I'm concluding that my loop, this process task, takes about 10 milliseconds. I'm running that four times. Sometimes things slow down a little bit, sometimes they don't, but that's about, that's about how long this takes. But your computer has multiple cores. So rather than doing one processing task and then the next processing task and then the next processing task, I could actually do all of them at once. Even the little environment that we use to run our code examples for this class has multiple cores. So how, how are we going to do this? In Java, if I want to create what's called a new thread of execution, this is a new stream of instructions that the Java interpreter is gonna start executing for my program. I create this using something called the thread class. Every thread executes separately. And if the machine that my program is running on has multiple cores, which most of them do, it's possible that different threads in my program will be running at the same time in different cores, so in parallel. The details of how threads execute the ProTam environment are something that you will learn a lot more about in 241. So we certainly don't have time to go into them, but you can think of them as just another part of the program. It's just another piece of code that's running. It can modify variables, it can run the functions that are defined on the class, et cetera. But what is the thread going to do? How do I get it started? So in Java, the way this works is in order to use, create a thread, I have to give it a starting point. So every thread has to start in a function. If you remember main, main was the starting point or the entry point, sometimes we refer it to, as my entire program. When I create a thread, I also have to tell Java where should this thread start executing. The way I do that is I implement the runnable interface. You guys know about interfaces now, so that's kind of fun. Um, runnable is an interface that requires me to provide one method. That method is called run. That method takes no arguments and returns no value. 
All it does is serve as a starting point for a new thread that I create. So once a class implements runnable, I can, I can create a thread that starts in that class. Every time I create a new thread, that thread will start running in this method called run. All right, so let's see this in action. So here's my example. I've implemented the runnable interface. I've, um, what I'm gonna do when the class runs is I'm gonna print, uh, hello. Seems like a good place to start, you know, let's get to know each other. Um, what happens now? Crickets. Okay. Why? Why doesn't this work? Any guesses? So I'm creating a new thread, I'm passing it a class that implements runnable. There's no compiler runtime errors, but I don't see that message. Why not? So let's walk through what happens when this program runs. So I get to line seven, I create my new thread object, and then line th eight, I call, I, I get that started. I'm gonna call a, a method called start, which starts that thread running. It's gonna start running by running the run method, but then what does my program do? Immediately after that. I create the thread, I start it up, and then, what does the main method do? It exits, right, so the whole program stops. So the reason that I'm not seeing the message for my new thread is before the thread even really gets started running, my whole program terminates. And so if I, if I force the thread, here's an example, right? So if I force the thread that started the new thread, my main thread, to slow down a little bit, it's possible that sometimes I'll see the message from this new thread I created. So here's an example. This doesn't happen every time. So here what happened is on line eight, I started up my new thread. The important thing to notice here is that this thread is completely independent of the thread that created it. It's doing its own thing. So it's gonna start running. Now here the main thread, the thread that ran the main method, is going to print world to the console. And on this particular execution, that slowed it down just enough that the child thread that I created, or the new thread, was able to print before the program exit. But you'll see, sometimes this works, sometimes it doesn't. So this is inconsistent. We'll come back and talk about this in a minute. So once I start creating threads, I need some way to control them and to communicate with them. And Java has a bunch of different ways for, of, of doing this. So thread.start, you're seeing me using already, that's how I start a new thread running. I also have something called thread.join. So called on a thread object that has started to run, this will wait for that thread to complete. When does the thread complete? The thread completes when it exits the run method that it started. So whenever that run method reaches its end, the thread completes, and thread.join will return. I also have something called thread.interrupt, which I can use to stop a thread that's running, but th this, is, this is a little bit more complicated. All right, so now, I'm doing this a little bit differently. So I'm creating my new thread object on line seven. That's gonna start running in my example class in the run method. I start it up on line eight. I print to the console world, and then I wait for it to finish. And so now, every single time that I run this, I will see both output from the main thread and output from the new thread that I create. The reason is that before the main thread exits, it calls join. That forces it to wait until the new thread finishes executing the run method. I could put anything I want in here. I could put a big loop. It will still work. It doesn't matter what I do in the run method. The main thread will wait for it to finish. Okay, so let's apply this to our example from before. So again, going back, I'm running this just fake processing task that's doing some pretend work, and this is still taking me about, you know, 43 milliseconds every time. So here's an example of how to run this task. So I'm running process four times. But before I was running them sequentially. 
on the same thread. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, hey, I've got multiple cores. I could execute those processing tasks independently, and they could all run on multiple cores, and they'll get done faster. So how am I gonna do that? So I'm gonna go through, I, have, I still have a loop here. At every, every time in the loop, I'm gonna create a new thread. I've renamed my process method run, but I could have just called it from run. That's, that would have been fine. So my run method is actually going to do the work that the process method was doing before. I create, every time through the loop, I create a new thread, I start it, and then I save a reference to that thread in an array. The reason I'm gonna do that is then what I do down here is I go through the array and I wait for every one of these new threads that I've created to finish. So I create four new threads, I send them on their way doing stuff, and then the main thread enters the loop that starts on line 13, and one at a time, it waits for all of these new threads to finish. Once they're done, I grab a timestamp and I print off how long it took. So let's see if this works. Okay, well that's better. So this task before that had never taken less than 40 milliseconds is now completed in 25. If you run this a few times, you can start to maybe draw some conclusions, well, sometimes it's worse, about how many cores our little server that runs these Java programs is running on. It's running on a two-core machine. So each one of those processing tasks runs sequentially on a single core. All right. Let me finish up today by talking about, you know, two terms that you hear used a lot once you start talking about this style of programming. So why are we talking about this today? The, the main reason we're talking about this is, again, multi-core is a reality of the world that you are living in. At some point, that reality is gonna sink in enough that we probably will never teach you how to think about a single core system. Single-threaded programs are, on some level, very old-fashioned at this point. Again, even your core, even your phone has four cores. You know, like 10 years ago, it was like, well, I know that there are these multi-core machines out there, but they're mainly, like, in data centers, and they're these big servers, and you can learn about how to program them later. That's over. I mean, even cheap little computer devices that you can buy for pennies now frequently will have at least two cores. So this is a reality of the world. Once you start thinking about how to write programs better in this environment, you encounter two different concepts, right? Parallelism and concurrency. These are not the same thing. Parallelism means that there are multiple things your computer is doing at the same time. Concurrency, on the other hand, refers to the fact that your program is able to make progress in multiple ways at the same time. Being concurrent does not require parallelism. And having access to parallelism does not mean that your program is more concurrent. So for example, let's go back. This program is not concurrent. It can only do one thing at a time. I'm gonna start in main, and I'm gonna run this ser single series of instructions. I'm gonna run that same processing task four times. So even if I ran this on a machine with 64 cores, it still can only do one thing at a time. This program is concurrent. It has been rewritten in a way that allows it to run all of those processing steps together. If I run this on a machine with one core, it's gonna perform very similarly. But if I run it on a machine with more cores, I'll be able to do those tasks in parallel. But concurrency is a function of this program, right? Not of the computer that it's running. Right? So I've, I've rewritten the code to make it more concurrent. If I have access to parallelism, that will allow the code to, to go faster. There's this fantastic talk a, you know, a really, really good talk about this by somebody at Google named Rob Pike that I would really encourage you to watch. He was, this, some of the thinking behind this went into the design of languages like Go, for example. So this is a really important distinction to understand when you're programming modern computer systems. So here's the reason that concurrency is important and something that we care about, not just parallelism. So your, your, your computer programs typically spend very little time running. That might surprise you. 
you, you know, your, your Java apps that you're writing for this class, if we looked at how much time they actually spend running instructions and actually doing things, it's pretty small. Why? Because they spend a lot of time waiting for other stuff to happen. So here's an example of things that your program might start be waiting for. Waiting for the user to enter some input. So you draw an activity on your app, and basically now you're just sitting there waiting for the user to finish filling in the form. Remember, users are slow. You are by far the slowest part of the computer system. The processor, the memory, even the disk, the network are all way faster than you are. Your, your phone can get data back and forth to Australia in the time that it takes you to fill out some little stupid, you know, survey, right, as, as part of the application, right? So waiting for the user, you do a lot of that. Waiting for some information that it needs to read from the disk. Um, waiting for some data from the network. So when your app makes an API request, it essentially is gonna wait for that data to come back. That's very slow compared with what the processor can do. You know, if you write concurrent code, what this means is that while your program is waiting for something, it can, it can make progress. It can still do other things, right? So the more concurrency your program exposes, the more likely it is that if one part gets stuck because it's waiting for a user or the network or something, there's other work that can still get done. So on Android, which you guys have been using for the final project, there's actually some programming constructs that are built into the Android system to force you to deal with some of these things, right? So has anyone gotten warnings about doing too much work on the main activity thread as they've been working on their, their final project? Okay, I see a few hands go up, right? So on Android, there's a single thread of your application that's responsible for handling events generated by the UI. When the user clicks a button or when the user you know, uh, moves to a different part of the app or whatever. If you bog that thread down, the entire app becomes unresponsive. So let's say that the user clicks enter and then you go decide to compute 10 billion digits of pi. Your app is just stalled. If I try to click somewhere else, if I try to click cancel, it's not gonna work. If I try to move to another part of the app, it's not gonna work. And so there are, are programming patterns in Android that are entirely designed around trying to avoid this kind of thing, trying to avoid having the main thread get stuck. This is one of the reasons, for example, that this library called Volley that you guys are using to do your web API request was created, was to essentially move this type of slow operation off of the main thread that's responsible for responding to the UI so that the UI doesn't become unresponsive. So if you did the work required to make a web API requ request and wait for the response in the main UI thread, your app would be totally unresponsive and nobody would use it. And so Volley is a way of offloading that to a different thread so it doesn't get in the way. All right, so let's do, let's do our last example here because this one's kind of fun, right? So before, our processing task was actually doing some work. It was running instructions. It was stupid instructions. It was just doing a loop. You know, but here let's replace it with waiting, a simulated wait. So this is a function called threads.sleep. This is part of the thread class. This sleeps for a certain number of milliseconds. So all this does is it will stop the thread, it doesn't do any work, wakes up 10 milliseconds later. So if I run these sleeping Let's say these are web API requests. Let's say that it takes about 10 milliseconds for you to make a web API request and get the result back. If I run them one after another, again, it takes about 40 milliseconds. Each request takes 10 milliseconds, and I do four of them one after another. If I run them concurrently, it's actually very cool, how long is it gonna take? About 10 milliseconds. I start up the first one, <coughs> it goes to sleep. I start up the second one, it goes to sleep. I start up the third one, it goes to sleep. I start up the fourth one, it goes to sleep. 10 milliseconds later, they all wake up, and I'm done. If you were doing web API requests, this would work. I start up the first one, it makes the request, and then waits for a response. Now the second one starts making a request, waiting for a response. Third one does this, fourth one does this. About 10 milliseconds later, I get results back from the first one, the second one, the third one, the fourth one, and I'm finished. Question. 
Yeah, so when I call thread sleep, there's an exception that it can throw. Uh, it's, it's a thread interrupted exception. I don't care about that. So I'm just ignoring it. Yeah, the question was, why is there an empty catch block? All right, so I just have a couple of quick announcements as you guys are packing up. We're not gonna get to the rest of this, which is totally fine. So, final project fair. Last thing we will do together in this class. Next Thursday, starting at 5 p.m. Uh, in Siebel. So the fair part itself will be from 5 to 8 in Siebel. And then we'll move over here at around 8 o'clock and we'll do some final announcements in Folliger. We have some prizes for the winning projects. There's also extra credit that's on the table. Um, we have representatives for some companies that are gonna be coming by to check out your projects. Um, so we hope this is gonna be a good time. As I wanna always remind you, this is on reading day, therefore you don't have to do it. It's worth 1% extra credit if you do, in addition to all of the other goodies that I just pointed out. So one of the things we're gonna do in lab next week is that we're going to, your lab's gonna be selecting some of the best projects to feature at the fair, right? Those featured projects will be placed in positions where they get more visibility, more attention from the company reps and stuff like that. All right. You guys have a final midterm for this class that starts tomorrow. Good luck on that. I wish you the best. I will see you on Monday. Have a great weekend.